True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. Maria Marshall seemed to be living an enviable life. She was beautiful and wealthy with a successful husband and three healthy sons. It wasn't until Maria was killed that her friends, family, and neighbors saw how hard she'd been working to keep up appearances and keep her family together. On the night of September 7, 1984, Robert and Maria were traveling home from Atlantic City when, according to Robert, he pulled over at a picnic area with a flat tire. He told investigators that he was knocked unconscious by a blow to the back of his head, and about $2,000 of his casino winnings were stolen. He said he awoke to find his wife with two gunshot wounds, lying dead across the front seat of their car. Robert Marshall was arrested on December 19, 1984, three months after Maria's murder. The prosecution theorized that he had hired two men to kill his wife. To the affluent residents of Toms River, New Jersey, Maria's husband had been a devoted family man and a respected member of the community. But soon after Maria's death, his perfect image unraveled as the police investigation uncovered debt, infidelity, and a $1.5 million life insurance policy. This is a case which has had a lot of publicity over the years. Today we hope to tell Maria's story with depth and compassion, looking at how this infamous case affected Maria's children, those close to her, and the entire community of Tom's River. So this should be a really interesting conversation. And to start us off, our beer expert Dick is here with an excellent review. Why, thank you, Jill. You're welcome. I have a different beer today. This is Ramstein Winter Wheat Icebach, brewed by High Point Brewing Company in Butler, New Jersey. So it's northern part of Jersey. Tom's River is southern part, but that's okay. It's a small state. Yeah, tomato, tomato. So Icebach, which I've never reviewed. This is a beer that's created by freezing off a portion of the water and removing it from the beer. Well, how neat. What's the point of doing that? Well, what this does, you'll increase the beer's body, potentially increase the flavor, and you'll certainly increase the alcohol content because the alcohol hasn't frozen. Well, right. that sounds like a worthy endeavor then. So, and this one is uh, 11.5% alcohol by volume. So it's up there. Sure is. So this ice buck is a deep brown beer with some lighter coloring around the edges of the beer. Has a small tan head that lasts forever. Very nice. Very nice aroma of chocolate and caramel and some dark fruit. The taste pretty much follows that nose. Raisin, chocolate. Caramel's still there, maybe not quite as prominent as the, the nose implied. It's a very full-bodied but smooth beer. A delight. A delight? Yes. All right, let's open that up because I could use a little delight today. Okay, we'll take it down to the quiet end and pop the top. Okie dokie. Well, I'm glad to be here at the quiet end. It's been a long, busy day, and it's nice to just sit back and relax with someone I love and talk about murder. Yeah, you know, that's what most couples do. Yeah. yeah. What else would they do? Sure. Okay, well, why don't you start off our story? I will do that. So we're going to start with Maria. So Vincent Puzinski didn't want to take any chances with his daughter Maria. Way back in 1917, when Vincent was just nine years old, his mother was one of the first people in Philadelphia to die in a plane crash. Vincent was out on a Sunday afternoon stroll with his mother, father, and brother. A man with a flying jenny was offering rides in it for five dollars. So his mother agreed to go up, and his brother begged her, so she took him along. Young Vincent and his father watched as the plane fell from the sky, killing his mother and brother. So Vincent vowed right then that he didn't want to lose anyone he loved again. Well, sure, but you really can never vow to that. It's out of your control. It is, but that's what he vowed. But it gives us uh, an idea of where he was coming from with this, for sure. Doesn't it? How much he treasured his daughter. Deeply treasured his daughter. Now, Maria's parents were deeply religious people, and Maria was their only child. 
And for over 40 years, Vincent practiced medicine from an office attached to the house. Maria went to Catholic schools. When it was time for college, she attended Chestnut Hill College and commuted to it by trolley. But even then, her father still drove the three blocks to meet her trolley every afternoon. So a little, maybe, overprotective? Sure. Yeah. Well, Maria was only 15 when she met Rob Marshall, and they began to date secretly. She waited until she was in college before she mentioned him to her parents. Rob was going to a Catholic college at the same time, and Maria hoped that that would make him acceptable to her parents as a date for her. But they weren't really impressed with Rob. Maria's father said that the Marshall family were a bunch of gypsies who spent more money than they earned, and that Rob was just a phony. He probably would have said the same thing about any man who wanted to date his daughter, but there was some truth in part about what he was saying about Rob, about the overspending, the phoniness. It kind of was how he was. It was, but I can see where Vincent is coming from. I'm a father of three daughters. Mm -hmm. None of the guys that they dated were any good for them. Right, that's true. Yeah, I can see how that works, but I could also see how Rob might be a little bit of an annoying guy. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Well, we, we say that in hindsight. Absolutely. Knowing a lot of bad things about him, it's easy to say. But Rob did go to Pensacola for Navy flight training. He completed the course in 1963, and he married Maria three days after Christmas. After living in Florida and then overseas, the couple bought a ranch house in Tom's River in New Jersey. Their first son, Robbie, was born two months after they moved in followed by Chris one year later. Rob became a life insurance salesman, and he soon became a top salesman. Yeah, he had the gift. Yes, he was a real salesman. He could sell life insurance to anybody. And hardworking. At least at the beginning. Yep, and very determined. They moved into a larger house just blocks away, and their youngest son, John, was born in 1971. The Marshall family was at St. Joseph's Church every Sunday, Rob bought a brand new red Cadillac convertible with a white top. Tom's River residents admired the Marshalls. Their good looks, polite children, how they were always buying new possessions. Their house was custom built for them by an architect that Rob had hired, and they joined the local country club. That's what you do. Yeah, what else are you going to do? You're an up-and-coming person in the community. you got to be there. Well, okay. Well, at least that's his thing. Well, yeah, definitely. I agree with you there. Okay. I'll amend that. Okay. As a successful businessman, Rob felt like he was really the big man in town. He was a tennis champion and kind of powerful in the Rotary Club. He did some work with the United Way, and he was known as a big gambler at the nearby Atlantic City casinos. Now, even to their status-centered neighbors, Rob and Maria, particularly Rob, were a bit much. Behind their backs, people called them Ken and Barbie. Not too flattering, was it? Well, I mean, there are worse things to be called, aren't there? I I suppose, but (laughs) it wasn't until after Maria's death that the neighbors realized she may have been struggling to keep up that image. Oh, absolutely. She had to be. Definitely. I mean, nobody is perfect. Nobody can be dressed in all the right clothes, doing all the right things all the time. I mean, what kind of fun is that? Heck, no fun. No fun, no. So when Rob was growing up, his father was a traveling salesman. They spent Rob's early years in a rented house in Queens. Then they moved to Chicago, then Wisconsin, then Michigan. And they were always renters. A joke among friends and family was that Howard Marshall never owned a home. That's why Rob wanted to own everything he ever saw. By the time he was a teenager, the family was living in Thomaston, Connecticut. Now his father did eventually lose his salesman job, and they moved to Havertown, Pennsylvania. Rob spent a lot of time in the basement of the home playing drums and feeling superior to his parents. Not unusual for a teenager. No. No. He had problems in school. He failed junior year English and had to go to summer school. In summer school, he made friends with another boy, and they formed a band. And the band played at a party, and that's where he met Maria. Yes. Just that serendipitous moment. Well, it makes me think of West Side Story, one of my favorites. Maria. I just met a girl named Maria. That's probably how Rob felt, because Maria was very pretty. She was gorgeous. She had beautiful, long, blonde hair. But even better, she was a doctor's daughter. Getting a girl like Maria to be his girlfriend and then to marry him 
would be a big accomplishment for Rob. See, he's already looking out for the upper hand, the big bucks. Absolutely. He wants to move up. So he's not going to just marry any old girl. No. She's got to be not only beautiful, but come from a wealthy family yes. or a prestigious family. Right. So for the bulk of their marriage, Rob seemed to adore Maria. He doted on her, and he told anyone who would listen that she was the most beautiful woman he'd ever seen. When the bloom fell off the rose, so to speak, and Rob began to stray, he began to see Maria as more of a burden. She seemed perfect, but almost more like an ornament than a person. It started to annoy him. The marriage lacked passion, but to her sons, Maria was always very real, always loving, affectionate. She was a mom they could count on, very devoted. She was. She went to school sports for the kids, and she was very involved with her children, all three of them. She was, and I always think, well, she didn't have to work. So she was kind of in a position where it wasn't too hard to be that way. I just like to say that because a lot of moms have to work. They don't have the support of that, and they might not go to all these things, but they're just as committed and just as loving as mothers. Oh, I wasn't saying that. I know. I just but, I feel like I have to point that out. Thanks. <laughs> but she, she made sure that she was actively involved in their kids' lives. Absolutely. And not just that. I mean, she was there if they had problems, if they needed someone to talk to. She was genuinely caring and a friend to her children, in she, a good way, a friend. She was, and they yeah. could always talk with her. Absolutely. They did feel that way. More so than their father. Seems like that. Yeah. It was mom they went to when they had problems. Seems like it. Yep. So on September 6, 1984, Robbie Marshall was home from school. He had been kicked out of Villanova for a semester for drinking and for helping some other guys kick down the door of a resident assistant. It was suggested that he take a semester off and then re-enter. It's a kind way. It's better than being expelled. So Robbie had enrolled at Stockton State for the semester, but classes there didn't begin for another week. So he had some time on his own to kill. Robbie woke up around 11 o'clock, and his mom, Maria, asked him to lunch with both of his parents. They were going to the club. Now, things had been a little rough between Robbie and Rob Sr. since Robbie's suspension. Oh, he seemed like he was really angry about this. Yeah, I, th I think maybe we sugarcoated it a little bit when we said a little rough. Yeah. Dad had gone to Villanova, and that's what he wanted his son to do, his oldest son. And he was supposed to go to Villanova and be a star in everything he attempted. And here he is getting kicked out after one semester. So I can see where Dad's a little disappointed. Well, you know, Rob has this thing about him, which we see in a lot of murderers, in uh, appearances being more important than what's really going on in, a, in relationships and in families. Well, no question. Yeah. Because they all have that bit of sociopathy. Right. Narcissism, sociopathy, yeah. that sort of thing. Robbie wanted to make up with his dad, and so he agreed to go to lunch with him. He got dressed and went down to the kitchen where Maria was waiting for him. No Rob, though. God knows where your father is these days, Maria said. So it was shortly after noon when Rob did come home. He was irritable and in a hurry, according to Robbie. Now Rob was a 45-year-old man at the time. Over the past few months, he'd lost 20 or 30 pounds and had become kind of a bundle of nervous energy. One really strange thing that Robbie would remember from that day was that a car pulled up in their driveway as they were about to leave for lunch. Robbie had never seen the man before. Rob went into his home office with the man for a few minutes, and then he returned to the car. When Robbie asked who that was, Rob said it was Mr. Gerard. And Mr. Gerard said, have a nice vacation, before he got in his car and drove away. But there was no vacation coming up, so it was really a weird thing for him to say. And Rob said to Robbie, well... Mr. Gerard is just trying to be funny. So, really insignificant at the time, but later on, Robbie would look back at that it, and realize some things. It gained significance in hindsight, didn't it? Yeah, certainly. And there was another odd thing, was after they had lunch and they're driving back home, his mother took a cassette out of the car tape deck and looked at the little plastic box where the titles of the songs were written down. Do you have anything to remind you of me, she asked. Now, Rob seemed extremely cold as he pulled out a cassette from beneath his seat, tossed it into Maria's lap, and said, There, I do have something with your songs. <laughs> so, there. Yeah, it didn't seem like a very loving gesture, at least not to their oldest son. No. Then later that afternoon, Maria went upstairs to get ready for a night out with Rob in Atlantic City. This was going to be dinner at Harris Marina to be followed by Blackjack. Doesn't that sound excruciating? <laughs> 
It's not my idea of fun, but no, some people do enjoy it. They do, and this had been a, a weekly habit for the marshals. Gambling had been a popular pastime for the elite of Tom's River since the 70s when the casinos had opened in Atlantic City. Yes, and that's kind of when the neighborhood built up in Tom's River with the wealthy people. Yeah, yeah. and Tom's River was a nothing. Yeah. It's just a little spot in the Pine Barrens of southern Jersey. Mm -hmm. And then the casinos came. And everything changed. Well, they did. I grew up in New Jersey, and our vacation each year, this was in the 1950s, was to go to Ocean City, which was like five or ten miles from Atlantic City. But we'd go to Ocean City, and if every once in a while we'd head up to Atlantic City to fool around on the boardwalk and stuff. And there were no casinos. It was just Atlantic City. Wow. Just a big ocean city. Different world. Different world. Well, Maria came downstairs that evening around 6 o'clock, all dressed up and looking gorgeous. At 42 years old, she really looked more like a big sister to Robbie than a mother. But she wasn't her usual cheerful self, and Robbie would say she seemed edgy all that day. His father was gone again and late coming back, but Robbie didn't ask where he was this time. So they went off, and Robbie went to bed around midnight. He woke at 3 a.m. to the sound of a hand fumbling for the light switch on his bedroom wall. The light came on, and he saw his father in the doorway. His father was crying, and there was blood on the front of his shirt. The last time Chris Marshall, this is Robbie's younger brother, last time Chris saw his mother was on August 24th, when she had left him off on the campus of Lehigh University, getting ready for the start of his freshman year. So we have these two kids are like a year apart, and a sophomore at Nova, the other's a freshman at Lehigh. So Marie had stayed with Chris, putting away his clothes, making his bed with brand new sheets. He had eaten lunch with his parents. Throughout the meal, Maria cried intermittently, saying she would miss him. But he pointed out he was only two hours away, and he'd see her at least a couple of times each month. At two o'clock in the afternoon, on September 7th, we're going to fast forward a little. This is after Chris has been on campus for a couple of weeks. Yes, they went out to the casinos on September 6th. So, but on the September 7th, 2 in the afternoon, the day after, Chris is sitting on his bunk talking to his friends when his father showed up. Chris looked past Rob to see his mother, because he was used to seeing them together. But she wasn't there, and he could see on Rob's face that something was very wrong. Back at their house early that morning, Robbie and the youngest, John, were told by their father that their mother, Maria, had been murdered. Something about pulling into a picnic area to change a flat tire. Rob was hit in the head. Their mother was shot. And she was dead, murdered. Now, Little... how'd you like to be a 13-year-old? And, and not even that, even a 19-year-old. And your dad comes in and says, Guys, I got bad news. Your mom's been murdered. Mm, I can't imagine how no. that would be. Holy cow. Yeah. And John was only 13. Robbie tried to comfort him because his father seemed unable to. He told his little brother that their mom was in heaven. Rob kept repeating, I wish it was me. So this was between 3 and 4 a.m. John became hysterical, and Robbie himself couldn't stop crying. He felt sick. He felt lost. His mother had been murdered in the Oyster Creek picnic area off of the Garden State Parkway, 10 miles south of Tom's River. And that was on their way back from the casino. So Rob Sr. put on a clean shirt, and the police came over to the house. They took Rob to the station for a formal statement, and this left Robbie and John alone at home with just the family priest. Robbie called his girlfriend at 6 a.m. to get her to come over, so she came over to comfort him. After it was light out, Rob returned, and the phone started ringing. By 8.30 a.m., a number of friends were already arriving at the house. Somebody had followed them, Rob told everyone. A car had followed them into the picnic area when he'd turned in to check a tire that felt like it was going flat. It must have been someone who'd followed them all the way from the casino, he said. Someone who had seen them win money while they were playing blackjack. He knelt at the rear of the car to check the tire. Then, the next thing he knew, he woke up with his head bleeding. More than $2,000 was missing from his pants pocket, and Maria was sprawled face down across the front seat of the car. Now, that morning, Rob was on the phone making funeral arrangements, so he was acting quickly. He decided she would be cremated, they would have a memorial mass on Monday, and what he kept saying was, Maria would want it that way. Yeah, and the phone kept ringing and ringing, so finally Rob's friend Sal volunteered to answer the phone. 
Rob retreated alone to his office, and he left his boys to be comforted by neighborhood women. So he's kind of distancing himself. Yeah. I mean, don't you think you got these poor three kids that are, well, two kids, because Chris isn't home yet. You got these two kids that are probably just devastated. And where's dad? Oh, he's in the office. Yes, people would remark on his behavior being strange. That's definite. They definitely did. Yeah. So then Maria's brother, Gene, arrived. He was a lawyer and a pretty calming person. So Gene and Rob gathered two groups to break the bad news. Gene, Robbie, and John would go to Philadelphia to tell Maria's parents and to bring them back to Tom's River. Rob and his friend Joe Moore would go to Chris and bring him home from college. Now, Chris had been stunned to hear about his his mom's murder. His first thought was that it couldn't be real. Then his second thought surprised him, and he didn't say it out loud. Dad, if you had something to do with this, I'll never forgive you. So we'll find out that Chris is the one that doubts his father the earliest, and this first thought was an indication of that. Very, very, pretty much his very first thought. Yeah. he's, He's just been told what happened. Right, so there was something going on in that family that made him think that. Yeah. Yeah. He's uh, more tuned in with what's going on, I think, between his parents. Yeah, but he, he did feel a lot of shame over it. As soon as Rob returned home, he approached Sale, and he seemed more concerned with the list of calls than he was with the emotional state of his kids. He made himself a rum and coke and went around offering drinks to everyone as if he was hosting a party. Chris was curled up on the couch and crying uncontrollably as Maria's parents stared into space. John, the youngest, followed Rob around the room, hugging him repeatedly. Now, eventually, people began to leave one by one. The boys retreated to their individual rooms. Maria's parents went to bed in the guest room. Rob was awake in his office until 1 or 2 a.m. Uncle Gene was awake all night. He knew things, and he didn't know what he was going to do with the information that he had. Yeah, so early the next morning, Gene says to Rob, let's go talk, and they went to the patio that overlooked the pool. When Rob sat down next to Gene, he said he had something to tell him. And Gene said, good, when you're done, there are a few things I'm going to tell you. Yeah, so this is just one day after the murder. It's the following morning. It's the following morning. And a lot's going down already. So Rob told Gene he'd been having an affair. And Gene said that he knew. He knew that Rob had been having an affair with Sarah Ann Kraushar, who lived right down the street, two blocks away. Maria had told him. So back in June, Maria had shown Jean a folder filled with American Express receipts. These were receipts for hotels on Long Island Beach and other nearby areas. She had confronted Rob, who told her the receipts were for dinners with clients. Rob wouldn't admit to Maria about his affair, but she knew. Well, of course, that's a bullshit story. Well, and there were also the phone bills, right? Don't forget those. 40 or 50 calls per month to the Seaview Regional High School where Sarah Ann Crushauer was the assistant principal. Yeah, and there's no reason to be calling there, right? His oldest kids are out of high school, and his youngest isn't there yet. Yeah. So why is he calling the high school? Well, because that's where she works. Yeah, but he didn't even have an excuse for that, did he? No. No. Maria had told Jean she loved her husband, though, and she wanted Jean to help her save her marriage, so that was her idea on it. She wasn't trying to get a divorce. Not at that point. No. And Maria had shown Jean more evidence of Rob's affair. There was a closet where Rob had stored extra toiletries and cassette tapes with love songs on them. And these were songs Maria had never heard Rob play around her. Right, so Rob gets angry, right? Yeah, right away he got angry. Right away. He yelled at Jean that this was none of his business, and Maria had no right to go to him with anything. Jean reminded Rob of a conversation they'd had last August where Rob told him he was up to his eyeballs in debt and was sinking fast, and Rob had blamed it all on Maria's spending. Well, I think she did buy expensive clothes and do some spending, but I don't know if that was the whole cause of their financial problems. Well, it wasn't, but she did. I mean, she had to look good. Well, I think they were both that way, both spending beyond their means, definitely. (laughs) He was deeply in debt, that's for sure. I just think it's a very sad existence when that's your when you're trying to impress people, keep up with the Joneses. It's so pointless and sad. It's pointless because you never do keep up. And what's the point? Who cares? Everybody else is worried about how they look. They don't care. Right. It's just a stupid game that people play. Well, we can say that. Yeah. Well, I think it's the way it is. It is. There's no question about that. Right. Now, Maria had also come to Jean with financial documents. 
Rob had forged her signature on a $100,000 home equity loan application. Maria had called Jean just that past Tuesday, and she had sounded more upset than ever. She said things were coming to a head, and she was becoming truly worried. She had hired a private detective to follow Rob. She said she was finally ready to confront Rob, but she was afraid to do it alone. Jean was planning to come over on Monday, the Monday after her death, and sit down with them. But it never happened, of course, because Maria was murdered. Now Rob seemed really stunned by this news. He put his head in his hands and said, Why didn't you tell me? If you told me, then none of this would have happened. So let's think about that statement. That just kind of slipped out, didn't it? It seems like it, yeah. And it's pretty incriminating. Absolutely. It really startled Jean to hear it. And Jean said, what's that supposed to mean? Then Rob kind of backtracked, tried to cover his tracks by saying that he would have left Maria sooner if he had known that she knew about his affair. Yeah, well, that's, I guess, the best he could come up with. I guess. On the spur of the moment. I think he did know that she knew about the affair. She'd been trying to get him to confess to it for quite some time. Yeah, he knew she knew. Right. So Sarah and Rob were planning to move in together. They had put a deposit on a little beach house in Manahawken. They had a joint checking account and a safe deposit box. They were just waiting until after their kids went back to school. And that was fast approaching. We're in early September. Yeah, everything was coming to a head for sure. Rob had $1.5 million in life insurance on Maria. There was no doubt that the police would be looking at Rob. After all, he's having an affair, he's in deep financial trouble, and he had a large amount of insurance on Maria's life. So Gene, his brother-in-law and lawyer, advised him to come clean with investigators and with his family before everything comes out in the media. Right, but Gene wasn't actually his lawyer. He was a lawyer. A lawyer. Yeah. But he never represented Rob in anything. No, that's true. I got carried away. Yeah. Rob sat down with the boys and told them that there was another woman in his life. So, holy shit, this was within days of Maria's murder. And he was almost like anxious to tell them, excited to tell them about his other woman. That's right, he was. So his mind is just not working correctly at all. (laughs) No. No. And the funny thing was that Robbie immediately guessed who it was. He knew it was Sarah Ann. And Rob told his grieving sons that he and Sarah Ann were good together. He said that she wouldn't replace their mom, but she would be their friend. And he also told them that she would be spending a lot of time at the house, and they would get to know her well. Now, as you can imagine, the boys did not react well to that. That probably didn't sit real well to these kids that have just lost their mother. No, and who would think it would? It's just crazy. (laughs) Isn't it? And he had been told to stay away from her. Yeah. For appearances anyway, if nothing else. Yeah, but I mean, this is early on, and he just, like, can't wait to get her in. I know. Like, bring her into the family. What's wrong with you? Yeah. Well, Robbie told his dad that the minute Sarah Ann entered their house, he would be walking out. And then Chris agreed. And little John, he just cried. This kid was just kind of left behind in this whole mess. Yeah, he's kind of the forgotten one. Yeah. But Rob went on and on about Sarah Ann. He said she was sensitive, she was caring, and she was the most important person in the world to him now that their mother was gone. So kind of like, fuck you boys. That's right. It's all about me. It's all about me and my new woman. He said he needed her for his happiness, and he hoped that they would support him in this. And the boys are kind of shocked. They're young. So they said, you know, whatever makes you happy, Dad, pretty much. What else are they going to say at this point? It's all very shocking. Yeah, there's nothing else they can say. And when he was done talking to them, he actually had the nerve to say, your mother would be proud of you. Ouch. Yeah. So Chris is alone in his room afterwards, and he starts to remember things. The night of his senior prom back in May, when he and Robbie were dressed up in tuxedos, and their father, after taking pictures, told them to stop by the crush hours so Mrs. Crush Hour could see how handsome they looked. Then there was another night in early summer when Chris put on a sweater he'd gotten as a gift from Sarah Ann's daughter, Robin. His mother told him, do not wear that sweater. Sarah Ann is a bitch, she told him. Who knows where she got the money to pay for it. And that was kind of, um, I mean, it stayed in his memory because that wasn't the kind of person his mom normally was. Definitely out of character for Maria. Absolutely. Then later in the summer, just before he left for Lehigh, 
Maria had pulled him aside and told him that no matter what his father said, she did not want him ever going to the Kreshauer's house. So these are all big red flags flying. Right. And Robbie, for his mind, in his mind, thought about how secretive his father had become. He had started locking his office doors, so the boys no longer were able to use it as a shortcut to the driveway. Now he realized that his father had probably been on the phone with Sarian. In just over 24 hours, the Marshall boys had lost their mother and found out that their father was not who they thought he was. Yeah, so their whole life is basically turned upside down. They really don't have parents at this point. They don't. No. Well, this might be a time to take a quick break and mention our sponsor. Let's take a little break. Support for today's show comes from Freshly. If you're tired of spending hours preparing dinner, or if you just want easy, stress-free, healthy meals, try Freshly. Cooking can be fun, but some days you just want a delicious, healthy meal with no effort. Freshly is the new way to get dinner on the table in virtually no time. Their chefs cook and deliver delicious, freshly prepared meals so you can eat healthier without any of the work. Each meal is made to order just for you. And with a rotating weekly menu of more than 30 options, there's always something new to try. And better yet, Freshly's chefs and nutritionists make sure that every meal is all natural, nutritious, and made with only high-quality ingredients. So you can come home late from a long day of work and have a delicious chef-cooked meal waiting for you. Well, our favorite Freshly meal so far has been the Southwest Veggie Bowl. It's got great flavors and textures with lentils, quinoa, corn, black beans, and sweet potatoes. The sweet potatoes were delicious. And it was very fresh, just delicious meals. So order Freshly today and see what it is like to put zero effort into making dinner. Go to Freshly.com forward slash brewery to get $20 off your first six dinners. That's $20 off plus free shipping at Freshly.com slash brewery. So the time between Maria's murder and Rob's arrest for her murder really gives us a look at who Rob Marshall really was. He cried to friends about how much he missed Sarah Ann when his lawyer advised him to stay away from her. Within a week, he was sending her messages through his friends and making swooning recordings with love songs playing in the background. He verbalized more concern for what Sarah Ann was going through since Maria's murder than he did for his children or for his recently dead wife. Sarian moved out of her house, left her husband, and got a condo on the beach. Then Rob and she quickly became inseparable. She even began spending time at the Marshall house. She was at the house on September 21st when Detective McGuire called from the prosecutor's office. He said he wanted to come over and speak to Rob. Rob told Sarian to go to the mall for a while because he thought it's not going to look good for her to be here. But she actually refused to go. And she said, to hell with that, I've got nothing to hide. So she was there when the detectives showed up. And they already knew her from earlier questioning. So Rob, always the gracious host, offered them drinks. And this is when he was first asked about his connections to Louisiana. Detective McGuire asked if Rob knew a guy named James Davis from Shreveport. In his later reports, McGuire described Rob as visibly shaken when he heard the name. He became pale, and his hand holding the drink was shaking. Then Rob stopped being the friendly host. He told the detectives that he was represented by a lawyer and referred them to him. He wouldn't answer any more questions. Then McGuire brought up another name, Billy Wayne McKinnon. Rob just asked them to leave. (laughs) So that name, that name rang some bad bells, I guess. It did, both of them. Yeah. Well, just days later, Robbie answered a call when Rob was away on an overnight with Sarah Ann. And the caller was James Davis. It was urgent for Rob Sr. to call him as soon as possible. Robbie had heard his father just a few days earlier telling the police that he didn't know anyone by that name. So that made him wonder what was going on. He was getting worried. Yeah, because he's been told, I don't know anybody by that name. Right. And now a phone call came in from someone by that name. James Davis, I want to talk to your dad. It's important. Yeah, so things unraveled quickly. They did. So Rob returns home and Robbie asks him about Davis. Rob gave Robbie a story that made absolutely no sense. He said he had met James Davis once, a long time ago, at a party or something. They had made a bet on a basketball game. James won the the bet and Rob wired him the money. So he had no idea why he was calling him now or why he wanted him to call him back. 
Now, Robbie knew that this was kind of preposterous. His father had never watched a pro basketball game in his life, and he probably couldn't even name two teams in the NBA. So he's pretty sure his father is lying. Yeah, but he really wanted to believe his father. He was trying hard. Yeah, he was. So Rob went into his office and called Gene. He told him that he may be hearing that he sent some money to Louisiana, but it was just to pay off a bet, $3,000 bet on a basketball game. It's a significant so, amount of money to bet with a stranger. Isn't it? Yeah. But he's trying to get out in front of this because he knows that the cops are going to be finding out about this money. Sure. And he's got to get a story out fast. It's still really lame, though. It is. It's not but, you very know, smart. It's the best he could come up with. Yeah. Even Gene knew that Rob never followed basketball. And even if he had, he knew that the story made no sense. None. So it was the next Wednesday, September 26th, when the prosecutor indicted a Louisiana hardware store clerk on a charge of conspiracy to commit murder in the death of Maria Marshall. This brought a whole new twist to the story. Why was a Tom's River mother targeted by someone from Louisiana? But the man indicted wasn't Davis or McKinnon. It was a man named Robert Cumber. He was held in Shreveport on $1.5 million. So this was a 47-year-old who lived in a suburb of Shreveport. He worked at the Cattle Hardware Store in Cattle Parish. And he lived with his wife and her daughter from a previous marriage in a one-story, well-kept little house. But now he's in jail. He's been indicted. Now, the news of the Cumber indictment was capped off by further bad news for Rob. Sarian broke up with him. Now, this was an action advised by her attorney. I'm thinking Sarian was starting to f read the writing on the wall. Yeah. And it was time to distance herself from Rob. Yeah, but any of the reading we've done on this story was that this was much more upsetting to him than anything. Oh, no kidding. He was like a lovesick puppy or something. Well, look at the stuff he was doing. Yeah, really nauseous. Yeah taping songs and stuff, and he's acting like a lovesick teenager. Oh, yeah, make you throw up. Midlife so, crisis, I guess? Very much so. <laughs> so Rob sold his boat to a friend for $6,000 to pay his attorney. Then he checked into a hotel room that he had previously shared with Saran. After leaving a cassette with final words to his sons and leaving it at the front desk to be mailed, he emptied 50 restaurant capsules into a glass of Coke. But he didn't drink it. He stirred it with his finger and licked his finger, and it tasted very bitter. So he laid back in the bed and fell asleep. So this was his suicide attempt, I this guess. This was his suicide attempt. Which didn't really, wasn't much of an attempt, right? But the detectives thought that that was a possibility that he would do that. Because oh, they'd been definitely. following him, yeah. They'd, they'd been following him. They called his room at 1 in the morning to check on him. When he didn't answer, they feared he might end his life, so they called a rescue squad. <laughs> he was taken to the ER and then moved to a private room. Well, and being at the hospital kind of gave him a nice benefit there. He was kind of kept safe from everything for a while. At the hospital, he confessed to Gene that he gave $800 in cash to James Davis at the casino on the night that his wife was killed. Now, how coincidental that Davis happened to be in the casino at the very time that Rob was there. And Rob was handing him money. Right. Yeah, he said that uh, James was owed the money for an investigation, so it's not even a bet this time, it's a different story. His story was that $3,500 of his blackjack money was missing, so he paid an investigator a total of $5,500 to investigate his wife. He said he'd been handing the money over to Maria, and some of it was missing. So this makes absolutely no sense. First of all, you're not going to spend more money than you have missing. And it's his wife. Why wouldn't he just ask her where the money is? Well, again, this is the best story he could come up with. Now, they aren't very good. They're very, very poor stories. I've heard better stories. That's oh, for sure. Oh, far. Yeah. And all these guys are from Louisiana, so how could he think that these are random, separate things? You got me. Yeah. Well, I guess his big story was that one introduced him to the other. We'll get into that. But, yeah, it's just all very far-fetched, and I think that Gene was catching on pretty quickly here that something was definitely wrong. Yes, he did. So Rob did hire a lawyer, and his lawyer began to speak to the press. His lawyer said it was no secret that the Louisiana man and Rob had had business dealings. Rob had been getting into estate planning and had prepared an investment portfolio for the hardware store clerk. He would not get into details about it, but he acknowledged publicly 
that Rob had insured Maria's life for over $1.5 million and that it was actually a matter of record that he was having an affair. He quickly asserted that these were not motives for murder, however. So he's defending him by getting it all out in the open, but once you get it all out in the open, it sounds really bad. <laughs> Doesn't it? I mean, it's really hard to defend someone like that. Three days later, the lawyer said that he expected his client to be indicted for Maria's murder. The authorities had taken records of Rob's calls and financial transactions. He was actually acquainted with hardware clerk Robert Cumber. This is the guy who had been indicted. He had met him in the spring of 1983 when Cumber had been in New Jersey visiting relatives. Rob had asked Cumber to put him in touch with a private detective from Louisiana. A Robert suspected that Maria was having an affair of her own and he wanted her followed. So he hired someone from so far away as Louisiana for confidentiality's sake. I don't think you have to go that far for confidentiality. No, I don't think so. Now, the investigator that Cumber had chosen was a former deputy sheriff from Caddo Parish named Billy Wayne McKinnon, and he was using the alias James Davis. Well, that was the original story, but it's just a very twisted, confusing story. That's the original story. But it was Rob and his attorney's claim that the prosecutor's office had made the incorrect assumption that Rob had hired Davis to kill Maria when actually he just hired him to follow her. So they said that the claims of the prosecutor were just preposterous. And through all the rumors and publicity, as his children were just left to deal with it without either parent, Rob was just held comfortably in the psychiatric facility in Philadelphia. Now, he'd never even ingested the restaurant. So he was completely physically and mentally well. It was kind of a hideaway for him at that point. Yeah, he, he was uh, ensconced. Yeah, yeah. So Chris is back at college. John sent temporarily to live with John had been sent temporarily to live with Jean's family, and Robbie was alone in the house. Now most of his friends were away at college, so he's by himself there, and he and his girlfriend had broken up. So he's pretty lonely. He's going through a really bad time. He'd always counted on his mother during difficult times, and now she's gone forever. So he began to feel like he was having a nervous breakdown, and he began to have suicidal thoughts. He went out for a drive in his car, reached 100 miles an hour, was half hoping that he would die in a fiery crash. Then when he didn't, fortunately, he reached out to his Uncle Sal for psychiatric help. Yes, yeah, so from what I've read, this Uncle Sal was pretty helpful to the kids. He was a big help. Yeah which is good they had somebody. Yeah, they didn't have a father. No, no, they didn't. So Robbie was admitted to the psychiatric ward at Monmouth County Medical Center. Sal contacted Rob to let him know, but Rob was still obsessed with Sarian's rejection and was not responding to his pleas to reconcile. He sent flowers, wrote letters, even staged a suicide attempt. His next attempt to win her back was one of his syrupy cassette recordings. Yeah, no, I don't know what these were actually like, but the way they were portrayed in the made-for-TV movie, Blind Faith, they were pretty pathetic. <laughs> That's an understatement. Yeah. And Sarah Ann didn't respond to the tape, so Rob left the hospital, and then he returned to Tom's River. Robbie signed himself out of the hospital. And before long, Rob was leaving the house for long periods, often overnight, telling his sons that he needed time alone to think. So Robbie's still back home doesn't really have a father figure at all. No. Then October 12th, Billy Wayne McKinnon was arrested on a charge of conspiracy to commit murder. And it turned out there really was a James Davis, even though the story was that Billy Wayne McKinnon was assuming that as an alias. There really was a James Davis, and he too was arrested the next day for the same charge, conspiracy to commit murder. Yeah, and then eventually Rob got a new girlfriend. I guess he got over Sarah Ann. It was tough, but he managed. Yeah, and her name was Terry. Now, he took her away for a long weekend in Florida, and they stayed in the home of some old friends from Tom's River, named the Stevens. But over the weekend, he realized that it was Molly Stevens he was attracted to, not Terry. So he told Terry that their relationship would just have to be over now. And Molly Stevens went along with it. She moved out of her house, left her husband, and began to make plans for a future with Rob. Shortly after that, Rob told his boys that Molly was just like Mom, and she would be moving in, and they would all love her. I'm just amazed at this one. Yeah. And 
Sarian, who's now the love of his life, or had been, breaks up with him and won't respond to him, so he figures he's lost her forever. He hooks up with his Terry. They go away for a weekend, and boom, he's immediately smitten with Molly Stevens. So he dumps Terry and somehow talks Molly into, well, maybe not talk her into it, but she's with him. She leaves her husband yeah. to be with Rob. It's just, he, and she has to know about the murder. Yeah. So what the hell is she thinking? You can't make stuff like that up, can you? No, this is one of those cases you just can't make it up. It's stranger than fiction, for sure. So with no parents left, Robbie, Chris, and John were pretty much lost kids. When they were together, they didn't discuss whether or not their father was guilty. Now, since their mother's murder was foremost on their minds, this would make for some awkward silences. I could see that. Now, Robbie decided to have absolute faith in his father, no matter what came up. It was difficult because Rob was acting inappropriately, and the minds of the citizens of Toms River were made up that Rob was guilty. They felt sorry for the boys, but at the same time they had resentment against them for continuing to stand by their father. So the boys were largely ignored and avoided by the friends and neighbors who had been closest to their parents. So not only have they lost their parents, but they're losing a lot of the support in the community. They sure did. The lawyers for Cumber, Davis, and McKinnon had been working to block their extradition to New Jersey, and they did that for several weeks. But by late November, they lost their fight, and the three men were flown north. They were all charged with conspiracy to commit murder, and they could end up with death by lethal injection because they had the death penalty. McKinnon, 46 years old, was the former deputy sheriff. So he was six feet tall, weighed about 250 pounds. Davis was the gaunt one with hard eyes, and he looked like kind of like an old alcoholic country singer, if you want to look at that kind of cliche. Mm -hmm. Then there was Robert Cumber, short, nervous guy with glasses, and he looked really scared. The three pleaded not guilty to the charges, and their bail was set at a whopping $1.5 million each, so nobody was leaving anytime soon. So they were in jail. They're yes. not getting out on bond. No, they'd need a lot of money. So it was actually 2 a.m. on the night that Maria was killed when police were called to the scene. If you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Because we haven't really talked about the crime itself much. So Rob's there bleeding from a cut on his head. Now, he had already been taken to the hospital when Lieutenant Bob Gladstone arrived. Maria was still face down in the Cadillac. Now, the first thing that stuck out to Gladstone was how dark the area was. To reach it, a car would have to make a left at the end of the entrance ramp and drive down a single dark lane to where the picnic tables and trash cans were. The Marshall's Cadillac had parked about 50 feet down that little lane, and it was so dark that even with the lights of several patrol cars shining, Gladstone twice bumped into parked cars as he walked to the Cadillac. The growth on both sides was thick. There's a big sign posted at the entrance warning, Area Closed After Dark, Parking Prohibited. Now Gladstone saw right away that the rear tire on the right side of the Cadillac was flat. Then an officer who had been called to the scene filled Gladstone in on what they knew so far. The deceased was Maria Marshall. She and her husband had had dinner at Harris Marina in Atlantic City and had left around midnight. After passing the Barnegat Toll Plaza, Rob felt the vibration in the car. He knew the picnic area was nearby, so he pulled in to check the tire. He got out of the car and saw that the right rear tire was flat. Now, at that point, he saw a vehicle, a dark sedan, pull into the area and stop perpendicular to his car about 30 feet away. He said he ignored the vehicle. He went to the passenger side window and asked Maria to pop the trunk. Then he turned around and was struck on the head and knocked out. Now, he didn't know how long he had been unconscious. When he woke up, he saw that Maria had been shot. He ran out to the road to flag down help. So Robert told police he was missing that $2,000 that he'd won at the casino, and Gladstone had looked around the area and realized the toll booth was just three miles away, and then the Roy Rogers restaurant that had a well-lit parking lot and access to a phone was just three miles ahead. So why pull in there? Why indeed. One officer remembered Rob stopping at the car and patting Maria on the ass before he was taken to the hospital. So this is just what one policeman said. Yeah, but still, it'd but be it's kind just, of a strange goodbye. It'd be very strange, yeah. Maria had been shot in the back. She was wearing several pieces of gold jewelry, a necklace, a bracelet, and three expensive-looking rings. And Gladstone took a flashlight 
and looked at the flat tire, and that's when he noticed that there was a clean straight cut about an inch and a half long on the sidewall. The tire edges were smooth and undamaged, so there was no sign that the tire had been driven on flat or low on air. He had an initial impression that something was wrong with Rob's story. A trooper called the hospital and told them to hold Rob there until they could come and talk to him. So already they're really having some doubts about Rob's story. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's kind of preposterous. Well, I mean, they would have to go talk to him regardless anyway. Oh, definitely. Right? Yeah. yeah. But it is. it does have a lot of holes in it right off the bat. Even if you say, okay, he would have pulled in there, why would someone hit him on the head and shoot her twice? Right. It's that dark, it's a robbery. There's no need to kill her. No. No, because there's no assault other than that. Plus, they didn't take her jewelry. Yep. Yeah. Well, when the homicide detectives arrived at the hospital, it was a little after 4 a.m., and Rob was just heading for home. A priest from their church, St. Joseph's, was with Rob, and Rob had a white bandage on his forehead. He had five to seven stitches in his head, so not a very big cut. And he didn't appear injured or really particularly traumatized by the event. He seemed pretty okay. So police let him go home, and then they met him at the house at 5 a.m. And when they got to the house, so it's only like 45 minutes later, he's already changed his clothes and he's all cleaned up, and he went willingly with them to the station. It was half an hour later, it was half an hour later, while waiting to be interviewed, that the police noticed Rob had fallen asleep on a couch in the squad room. So he didn't seem very stressed out. He sure didn't. And he repeated his whole story to the police about the tire. He said that it just didn't seem quite right, right after they left the casino. And then it seemed to get worse the farther they drove on, so he wanted to look at it. But this made it odder that he'd driven past numerous toll parking areas and all-night gas stations before pulling into the secluded picnic area. The most suspicious thing was maybe the slash in the tire. Because if the tire was slashed, it would have been immediately flattened, and he would have had to have been driving on a flat tire. So that makes no sense at all. None whatsoever. So I don't know why he even did that. That just shows stupidity, really. Yeah. I mean, he could have just let some air out. Right. Instead of slashing it. Slashing, There's a lot of things. Slashing that kind of gives it away, doesn't it? It's a dead giveaway. <laughs> yeah, because you can't be driving for miles on a car that has a, a huge slash in it. No. You would notice that. So a private detective had contacted Gladstone the next day to let him know that he had been hired by Maria Marshall the previous December, right before Christmas. Maria suspected her husband having an affair. She suspected Rob was seeing Sarian and gave the private investigator a picture of her and Rob and Sarian and her husband. Shortly after that, Gladstone got a call from a lawyer named Michael DeWitt, who told him he was Maria's lawyer. Maria had told DeWitt she had two problems. One was that her husband was having an affair, and the other was financial problems. She had found out that her husband had gotten them deeply in debt. I think the number that was quoted was something like $300,000. Wow, that's quite a bit. And how did he get them in that debt? What was he buying? Well, he had the honey on the side. Yeah. <laughs> and I suspect, you know, it said they made weekly visits to the casinos. I'm sure he was losing more money than he was winning. Yeah. But he was, he was deep in the hole. Now, he tried to hide this debt from Maria by taking out a $100,000 home equity loan. And he got that by forging her signature. Yes, yeah, we mentioned that, yeah. Now, DeWitt had prepared a bankruptcy petition and a divorce filing for Maria, but he didn't file them. Her goal was to save her marriage, if at all possible. Yeah, well, over the summer, Maria had grown worried that Rob might be involved in criminal activities, though. She was afraid that he was using and maybe even selling cocaine. She was worried about how involved he was with the Atlantic City gambling world. She was afraid that debts might have made him dependent on people in organized crime. So in July, just two months before her murder, Maria had her lawyer prepare all the paperwork for the divorce and to keep Rob from using the house as an asset to get any more loans. And then the last time that DeWitt saw Maria was in mid-August, so less than a month before her murder. Yes. 
When the results of Maria's autopsy were available, Gladstone learned that she had been shot twice in the back at very close range. The trajectories of the bullets told him that she had been lying face down on the front seat when she was shot. So I'm trying to picture that scenario. If a robber came and said, you know, get down, and then you laid down on the seat, why would he then shoot you twice? And then if it was the type that would shoot you twice, why wouldn't he shoot the husband? Good questions. Yeah. Well, so th- those just some questions that come through my mind, and I'm sure there are many more by people who know more about crime. But well, and they don't stand up to good scrutiny anyway. No, not at all. No. Well, Sarian was brought in for questioning, like we said. And she consulted with two attorneys and did agree to questioning. She admitted to the affair, and she said it had begun about a year earlier. And she said Rob had been unhappy in his marriage. He complained to her that Maria was overly possessive and spent way too much money. She and Rob had made plans to leave their spouses and start a new life together. Within a week of Maria's murder, she and Rob planned to tell their spouses and move into a beach house together. For months, they had shared a downtown post office, and this is what they used to exchange their love tapes, (laughs) their love messages on cassette tapes that they did for each other. They'd leave one, and, you know, it's really very romantic how they would do that. Oh. Just um, some some kids in love. Just two little kids. Yeah. Teenagers in love. That's what they seemed like, yeah. You know, except for the whole murder part. Well, minor detail, right? Yeah. Saran remembered that before Christmas 1983, Rob had told her his financial difficulties would be over if he could just collect on Maria's insurance money. He asked Saran if she knew anyone who could take care of it. Saran said she told Rob that she never wanted to be involved with him if he could do that to his wife. And she told him she didn't want to hear him talk about that again. So he didn't talk about it again, but apparently he kept thinking about it. Well, he didn't talk about it with her. That's true. That's true. Well, once she said she didn't want to hear about it. Yeah. Of course, that's what she's saying, but there's nothing to indicate that she knew about it or had any involvement, so I guess I'd believe what she said. No, there isn't. No. We don't like her, but she's not a murderer, I guess. No, I don't think so. No. Now, while Sarah Ann was being interviewed, a call also came in from an insurance agent named Philip Girard. He said he called as soon as he heard about the murder. On the Monday before the murder, Rob had called him and said he needed a $100,000 insurance policy on his wife. He said he was in a very big hurry to get the policy into effect because he and his wife were leaving on vacation by the end of the week. So they did expedite it. A medical exam had been completed the morning of September 6th, and Gerard came to their house shortly after noon to sign the papers, just as the couple were getting ready to leave with their son for lunch. Yeah, so that's the interaction that Robbie was remembering. Right. Yeah. So McKinnon was given a plea bargain for agreeing to testify against Marshall and for giving police the name of Larry Thompson, who is a new entry into the the system. We hadn't heard about him yet. And McKinnon said that Thompson was the shooter. Four days later, Larry was arrested at a hamburger stand belonging to his new wife. He, too, was charged with the murder of Maria Marshall, held without bail, and extradited to New Jersey. Same afternoon, Rob was stopped by police while he was out Christmas shopping. Now, Gladstone had received a report that Rob had been inquiring at a local travel agency about flights from Miami. we got to do something. He's going to rab it. Yeah. Yeah, if he goes to Miami in Costa Rica, then he might not get extradited. He probably wouldn't. He'd probably done his research and figured out what country he could go to. Well, I don't know. He didn't seem like much of a researcher, the way this whole thing was handled. I mean, I think well, that was one of his biggest defense things, was saying, why would I do something so stupid? Why wouldn't I cover true. my tracks? Yeah. Yeah. But there were two plainclothes officers and two uniformed officers who approached him and searched him before putting him in the back of a cruiser. His bail was set at $2 million. The prosecutor's office announced that they would seek the death penalty. Robbie returned to Villanova, And he did manage to complete his spring semester. I'm pretty impressed with that. Chris stayed at Lehigh. John completed the 8th grade and entered Tom's River High School in the fall. Now, he lived in the family home with the supervision of his father's mother's friend, Tessa McBride. Tessa was absolutely loyal to Rob, though, and she scorned the prosecutor's office and kept anyone who had any doubts about Rob's innocence away from John. And I wonder if that really must have had an influence on John, because I think to this day, 
He's the one that has stood by his father. He has. So, yeah, I guess it would be reasonable to figure that if you're in the care of a woman who is unflinching in her support of your father, yes, that's how you're going to take it. Well, you're raised that way then, yeah. Plus, he wasn't old enough to see the weird things that were going on in his right. parents' marriage like the other boys were. Yeah, true. Well, Rob and Larry Thompson went to trial together, and charges against Davis had been dismissed and Cumber would be tried separately because he didn't face the death penalty. Robbie was in court for opening statements, but Chris stayed at Lehigh. Chris had lost total faith in his father, but Robbie was still holding on, giving him the benefit of the doubt over and over again, really. When Robbie told Chris that Larry Thompson's wife had moved into their house, Chris thought, you must be kidding, this was outrageous. But he wasn't kidding. Tessa had invited her as an act of Christian charity, she said, and it was what Rob wanted. Actually, he's the one that had planned the whole thing, because Larry and Rob were on the same side now, and they told Rob's son, John, that they needed to stick together. So Larry's wife's living there with Tessie and John. A very weird situation. Isn't it? And I don't know what the older boys were doing over the holidays and things. They must have had to come and live there during certain times of the year. Yeah, but there's nothing much mentioned about those times. No. So I think they, if they were there, they were there as little as possible. I know, but that makes me sad for the little one. I mean, he's lost his whole family. His brothers have gone to college. His mom is dead. Yeah. His dad's in prison. So it's just amazing that he even lived through the whole thing. During the six-week trial, Rob Marshall revealed that he was planning to leave his wife and he said he'd hired a private investigator to determine if Maria was consulting with a divorce lawyer and to determine the whereabouts of, now he said, over $15,000 of missing casino winnings. This amount just keeps growing, doesn't it? It does. He admitted that he was involved in a 14-month affair with Sarah Ann Cushauer. Sarah Ann testified that Rob told her he wanted to get rid of his wife to use her insurance money to pay off his debt, so she turned on him completely. Rob was convicted of capital murder for this murder for hire in 1986, and he was sentenced to death by lethal injection. Larry Thompson was acquitted of the murder charges due to testimony mainly from his family members, who testified that he was in Louisiana at the time of the killing. So it couldn't have been him. That's what they said. He wasn't anywhere near New Jersey. (laughs) Though sentenced to death, Marshall remained on death row for many years because the state of New Jersey hasn't executed anyone since 1963. In 2002, he wrote a book called Tunnel Vision, Trial and Error, and in this book he challenges the conclusions that McGinnis drew in the book Blind Faith. He pointed out he pointed out flaws in the judicial he pointed out flaws in the judicial process that he believed had failed him. He also alleged that his trial was contaminated by police misconduct and compromised testimony and evidence. So after a June 2003 U.S. Supreme Court decision raised the standard for a defense lawyer's duty in death penalty cases, many death sentences began to be overturned, and Marshall filed a petition arguing that his lawyer had not met minimal constitutional standards. Though lower courts initially rejected this argument, A U.S. District Court judge ruled in 2004 that Marshall received ineffective assistance from his attorney just during the death penalty phase of his trial. So the Third Circuit Court of Appeals upheld the decision in 2005. In 2006, the U.S. Supreme Court declined to hear an appeal by the New Jersey Attorney General's Office. In May 2006, Prosecutor Tom F. Collar declined to retry the death penalty phase of the case. And he cited the reasons were the difficulty in presenting evidence more than 20 years after a crime had been committed and the probability of many more legal appeals if Marshall was sentenced to death again. So with resentencing pending, Marshall faced a minimum of 30 years in prison and a maximum of life in prison with no possibility for release. In 2006, he was resentenced to life in prison with possibility of parole in eight years so he would have been eligible for parole in 2014. Until his removal from New Jersey's death row, he'd been the longest-serving inmate there since the state reinstated the death penalty back in 1982. 
So most recently in January 2015, a parole board hearing for Marshall, which was his first, was approved and scheduled for March. His older sons, Robbie and Chris, vowed to speak in front of the board against their father's release. But people noted that their younger brother, John, had always believed in his innocence. So with his health reportedly failing following a debilitating stroke, Rob Marshall died in the state prison in February of 2015. So he didn't get to his parole board hearing. No. But there's a little extra something to note about Thompson. Yeah, so in April of 2014, while he was in jail for other crimes committed, Thompson admitted to having committed the murder of Maria Marshall. And this was the guy who was acquitted. This was the guy who was acquitted because he had eyewitnesses that placed him in Louisiana at the time of the killing. Right. So the witnesses who lied on his behalf also couldn't be charged since the statute of limitations for perjury in New Jersey is five years. And double jeopardy precludes Thompson from being tried again. However, his earliest possible parole date under his current sentence is 2071. So he's still got a few years. Well, he's not going to live that long. So Larry Thompson ultimately confessed to committing four murders. Add to that a bank robbery, 33 night deposit box robberies, and three armored car robberies spread across the U.S. He was also paid to burn down two businesses, a former meat market, and a residence. Busy man. He was a career criminal. And, well, if you hear the detectives talk, they knew that he was a bad guy from the beginning. And as soon as they knew he was involved, they knew that Rob Marshall was involved in hiring these people. Yes. So the homicides. uh, Thompson killed his good friend's wife, Deanna Montgomery, January of 1979 in Shreveport. In June of 1979, he shot Chester Underwood to death in Texas. In 1984, he shot New Jersey socialite Maria Marshall. And on June 1988, he shot Larry Wayne Lester on a logging road east of Mansfield, leaving his body to rot there until it was found on October 2nd. And by his own admission, he had killed more people. Yeah. Now, there is an abundance of information on this case. So if you want to learn more about it, there's definitely a lot that you can learn. The primary source for us was the book Blind Faith by Joe McGinnis. McGinnis changed many of the names in the book, too, but I think we got them right. I think we figured out who was who. I think so. We tried to use real names in our discussion as much as we could, and I think we were successful. There is a lengthy series of articles available in the New York Times online that really make for some great reading. Because if you look through these articles, you can follow the story from early on, when the death was reported, all the way to a couple years ago, what, three years ago, with the appeals process. So... It's really um, definitely a lot to be read about if you want to learn more about it. There's a lot of info out there. And a lot to learn about it is just people's reaction to it. Because the community really just hated him. And then there were all these arguments on the other side about how he was just demonized by the media right away. Yeah. Yeah. I think he did that to himself. Yeah, maybe. It kind of looks that way. Oh, and then there's, of course, the made-for-TV movie with Robert Urich as Rob Marshall. Yes. Yeah. It was a pretty good movie, although I I think it (laughs) adhered to the book. It was totally by the book, I think. Yeah. 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 So, But before we go, give us a little reminder about today's sponsor. Freshly. If you're spending hours on dinner or working really hard trying to master those meal kits, give Freshly a try. Freshly is the new way to get dinner on the table in no time. Their chefs cook and deliver delicious, freshly prepared meals so you can eat healthier without any of the work. Each meal is made to order just for you, and there's a rotating weekly menu of more than 30 options with high-quality ingredients. And they're also made from all-natural, nutritious ingredients. So if you order freshly today, you can see what it's like to really put absolutely zero effort into making dinner. So you can live a life like mine, because I put no effort into making dinner. (laughs) <laughs> because my husband cooks. There you go. So everybody could be as happy as I am by using Freshly. Go to Freshly.com forward slash brewery to get an offer with $20 off your first six dinners. And then just a couple of reminders before we get to feedback. If you enjoy our podcasts and you'd like to get more of them, you can go to tigrabber.com and sign up to have access. We have 20 extra episodes in the feed with new ones being released monthly 
Over the past year, we've released members-only episodes on the O.J. Simpson murders, the Diane Downs case, the Craigslist killer Philip Markoff, and many more really fascinating cases. In March, we covered Amish serial killer Eli Stutzman and the death of his son Danny, also known as Little Boy Blue. In April, we covered the torture and murder of 19-year-old Colleen Slemmer while she was away at a Job Corps campus trying to continue her education, and she was killed by another student there. One more thing, we're going to be at CrimeCon in Nashville next week from May 4th to May 6th. It's our first time there, and I hope a few of our listeners will be able to make it out and go out and have some beer with us. If you can make it, you can get $10 off your tickets by using promo code TCBrewery. Just go to CrimeCon.com and use TC Brewery to get that discount. And thank you for everyone who sent us the feedback. We've got a great bunch of feedback today, so let's get started on that now, Dickie. Okay. First up, David R. from Georgia, with a comment on the Robert Chambers preppy murder case. The maturation of Chambers was like that of a virulent pathogen in a Petri dish. (laughs) Conditions could not have been any better to produce a narcissistic psychopath had his mother tried and then she rationalized his behavior to the point accountability was not to be had. What a waste of a human being. Yeah. No disagreement here. No. And that pretty much tells us what most of our listeners had this kind of same idea about him. But I really felt like David had uh, had a nice way of putting it. He has a way with words, doesn't he? Yes. And then Rebecca M. wrote to us about Oba Chandler on our recent episode, Terror by Sea. Thank you for an excellent job on your latest episode about the murder of the Rogers women slash girls. Oba Chandler was truly evil, if anybody ever was. I lived in Tampa when these murders happened, and I remember being afraid to be out after dark. The fact that the Rogers accepted the offer of a boat ride is just evidence of how unsuspecting they were and how they had faith in other people, despite how Michelle had been victimized by her own uncle. It's so sad to me that their trust was used against them to make them victims. I'm with Jill on the death penalty in general, but I won't lose any sleep over Chandler's execution. Good riddance to bad rubbish, as my mother used to say. So Yeah, I think that's the general tenor of the uh, Oba Chandler episode. Yeah, definitely. That was a really shocking crime. Terrible. So now we have a case suggestion from Cruiserweight190. You guys should do a show on Ricky Casso. He murdered one of his close friends and left him in the neighborhood woods, then proceeded to lead tours to many of his friends to view the body, without anyone turning him in. This was back in 1984 and really helped kick off the satanic panic craze because Casso listened to heavy metal and proclaimed he was a Satan worshiper. It was also the inspiration for the movie The River's Edge with Keanu Reeves. I think I saw that movie. Well, I think you've seen every movie with Keanu in it. (laughs) Yeah, well, maybe. Okay. So the conflict between Ricky Casso and his victim, Gary Lowers, had started sometime before the murder, when Lowers stole ten bags of PCP from Casso's jacket after he had passed out at a party. I hate when that happens. I know. you got your stash in your pocket and someone rips you off. Yeah, well, especially the PCP. That sucks. Yeah. So Casso was the son of a local high school history teacher and football coach at a fluent Cold Spring Harbor High School. He had been thrown out of his home as a young teen and lived on the streets of suburban Northport, New York, usually sleeping in the local woods or in the cars, garages, backyards, and houses of friends. At some point during the night, Casso scuffled with Lowers, bit him on the neck, and stabbed him in the chest. Then Casso continued his assault on Lowers. He was stabbed somewhere between 17 and 36 times, and his eyeballs had been sliced out during the stabbing. Wow. During the attack, Castle allegedly commanded Lowers to say, You love Satan, but Lowers is said to have instead replied, I love my mother. After the attack, Castle covered Lowers' body with leaves and small branches. Then in the aftermath, Castle bragged about the murder to friends. He claimed that Satan manifested in the form of a black crow after killing Lowers and that the crow had caught, something he interpreted as Satan's approval of the murder. Casso even brought several disbelieving teens to view Lowers' decomposing body before he returned to the woods to bury the remains in a shallow grave. 
Now, it wasn't until two weeks had gone by that the murder was reported to the police via an anonymous tip. So obviously a disturbed individual, but maybe the most shocking thing is how long it took anybody to report it. Yeah, well, we've had examples of that and other things where people just don't do what they're supposed to do. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So a case suggestion from Lindsay. Dick and Jill, thank you for putting together this great show. I listen to and watch a lot of true crime, but your show is one of my favorites. Thank you, Lindsay. I find that your cases are always well-researched, and the both of you are very insightful. I enjoy the married couple banter, and as a nurse, I always like Dick's medical perspective. I have a case suggestion that I would really love to hear you cover. El Timio Sanchez, the bike path rapist from Buffalo, New York. This man terrorized Buffalo and its suburbs for 25 years. He is known to have killed three women and raped many more, including numerous young teenage girls. He stalked his victims on the back paths, trails, and shortcuts used by kids and runners all throughout western New York. Sanchez lived a double life as a normal suburban family man. He participated in the memorial community activities for his victims. His wife, friends, and family never had any idea that this man was a monster. Meanwhile, another man, Anthony Caposi, sat in prison for 22 years, falsely convicted for two of the rapes. Caposi was mentally ill but never violent and always maintained his innocence. His parents campaigned for years to help their son, who they never believed was guilty. The details of this case are intriguing. The way in which they ended up catching him involves a victim spotting him at the mall and following him, followed by some great police work. Sanchez's murder victims were a 22-year-old college student, a young prostitute, and a 42-year-old nurse and mother of four. This case never gets covered by true crime shows, although there is plenty of information, including a couple of books, an episode of Dateline, an article in the New York Times, and several in the Buffalo News. Thanks again for all your hard work. So I have read some more about this one, and I think we are going to cover this one this summer, if it's okay with you. Oh, sure. Okay. It sounds interesting. Yep. Then we have an episode suggestion from Amy S. Yet another super fan to weigh in on your wonderful podcast. I'm an avid listener of True Crime Brewery and eagerly await the newest cast. Your easy banter and mellifluous conversation style is just a ticket when I need my true crime fix. Wow, this is like big praise from Amy. Tell you, I'm dropping you a line to give you the 911 on a horrific case I've yet to see covered in any of you of the mainstream true crime pods. It happened in a very sleepy hamlet called Dryden, a small town near Ithaca, over Christmas break in 1989. Late afternoon, three days before Christmas 1989, a family of four was shot execution-style in their homes, their bodies doused with gasoline and the house set on fire. The mother and father, Dolores and Warren, along with their young son, Mark, were held in one room while Shelby, the Harris's teenage daughter, was isolated in another room and sexually assaulted prior to her murder. The bodies were found the next morning when the nearest neighbor spotted the burning house and alerted authorities. A suspect was identified, and a manhunt unprecedented for the area began. And this ended a week later with a gunfight between the suspect, Michael Turner, and the police. Turner was killed. Turner's mother, Shirley King, was convicted for her role as an accomplice in covering up the crime. In a bizarre twist, several years later, her conviction was overturned after it became known that evidence had been tampered with. After careful investigation, authorities drew the conclusion that the motive behind the crime was a robbery that had gotten out of hand. Now, we've actually covered this. Well, I wondered if you were going to remember it. We haven't done it on True Crime Brewery, though. No, it was on ID, right? Yep. And it was, it was called like the Village of the Dam because of a series of crimes and murders that had occurred. Yeah, I think this was the lead crime that this, started off the whole series. This was the first one. Yep. Yeah. And so, it was the scary one. It was the best episode of the series, too, we decided. By far. Yeah. So maybe we should do a, a full True Crime Brewery episode on it. Well, I think when we covered it on Watching ID, we said that this crime probably would have been enough for a full episode. Well. So we might want to do that. We might want to do that. Okay. Let's think about it. I'm impressed that you remembered. Well, I'm not into senility just yet. <laughs> 
That's not what I meant. I just didn't know if you'd remember that. So I have another case suggestion from Not A Real Tory. Jill and Dick, I love your podcast. I particularly like the calm way you present facts and information without breathless drama or other nonsense. And this is what our retractors would call our monotone, boring way of presenting the cases. Yes. Yes, but I prefer the way that Tori says. She has a nice way of describing us. She continues, My husband especially appreciates the beer reviews. In fact, that's why he listens. He's not a fan of true crime as he deals with it in his job. But then she mysteriously doesn't tell us what his job is. So this could be Joe Kenda's wife. (laughs) (laughs) Sure. He suggested a possible case for you to look into. In 1998, Lisa Garner and her parents, David and Mary Ann Hanshu, were shot to death in Lone Tree, Colorado. Lisa's one-year-old daughter, Sophie, was injured but survived. The police arrested Lisa's husband, James. James had previously experienced serious financial pressures in 1993. At that time, he apparently attempted to fake a new identity and run away from his wife and eldest, then only, daughter when they lived in Kansas City. About three weeks before the shooting deaths of the Hanshoes and Lisa, there had been a serious gas leak at the home, whose cause was not, as far as I'm aware, ever resolved. Weirdly, James was acquitted at trial only to face a wrongful death and custody suit from his former sister-in-law. He lost custody of his three daughters. James went on to commit mail fraud and has twice been convicted of that crime. He is currently serving a sentence in California. Technically, the Hanshoes and Lisa's murder are unsolved. My husband grew up with James, and he opinions that James is indeed guilty. His exact words, that guy was a thug then, and he's a thug now. See, that would be something Kenda might say. Right. Yep. Almost everyone who dealt with the case professionally believes that Garner is guilty. However, sloppy police work undermined the legal case. I think you would be able to do a great job exploring and explaining both Garner's early years and their impact on his later actions and the extreme emphasis on money in all his actions. You might also find it useful to cover a case where the difference between experienced law enforcement and law enforcement that does not routinely deal with murder cases makes all the difference in justice. If you want further info about this, you can contact me via email. Thanks for your riveting podcast. I listen while cleaning my kitchen, and now it's spotless thanks to you both. Well, thanks, not a real Tory. I might have to look into that. Yeah, that does sound like a good one. And he likes beer, so... Can't go wrong. He must be a good guy. Must be. Another case suggestion from Virginia B. Hi, Jill and Dick. I just wanted to write to tell you a few things. First, let me say how much I love your podcast. I listen to a lot of true crime podcasts. In fact, that's pretty much all I do while doing my daily cleaning at home. I'm a stay-at-home mom and housewife, so needless to say, I have quite a bit of time on my hands, and as a result, I spend about six to eight hours a day cleaning, momming, and listening to podcasts. That being said, True Crime Brewery is one of my top three favorite podcasts. I love your adorable banter, and being a beer lover, I enjoy learning about new beers from Dick every episode. I really do often find myself talking with you both, as if I'm at the quiet end with you which sometimes makes my family look at me (laughs) as if they question my sanity. Last night I discovered a true crime show hosted by Ice-T called In Ice Cold Blood. Oh, wow. I'll have to look that up. Yeah. I had just finished listening to your episode entitled The Final Act earlier and was quite excited to find the first episode in that TV series was about the same case. I found it really ironic. I do feel you guys covered the case much better in more detail. We beat Ice-T? Whoa. That's pretty cool. Second, I have a case suggestion for you. I live in Illinois, grew up in Peoria, in fact, although I have since moved farther south. When in my late teens and early 20s in Peoria, I was acquainted with a man named Larry Bright for many years, maybe close enough to call him a family friend. During this same time, there was a string of murders, with the victims being a number of African-American women known for prostitution. So imagine my horrified and disgusted surprise when a couple years after losing contact with Larry, I found his picture in the local paper declaring his arrest and subsequent confession to being the murderer of these women. Wow, that's creepy. Yeah. You had first-hand knowledge of this killer. She was with this guy. Contact. Contact. I'm not sure how much information you'll be able to find in this case, but to my knowledge, he is currently incarcerated in an Illinois state penitentiary 
serving a number of life sentences for these murders. If you're able to find information on this, I'd love to hear your and Dick's opinions about this horrific case. Thank you for your time and all your hard work, and I hope you guys keep it up for a long time. All right. Well, thank well, you, Virginia. Virginia, that's very nice. I'll do some research. Okay. Sounds good. All we right. Get, we get some great recommendations. We do. Just uh, People really pay attention. They do. And that's the thing. I feel like people know more about these cases than we do. It's a little intimidating. Yeah. <laughs> But I definitely enjoy hearing from people, so I hope people keep sending it in. And I definitely want to check out In Ice Cold Blood. I wonder what network that's on. Maybe it's on the same network as uh, Abrams versus Grace, or Grace versus Abrams. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Okay. We'll well, I think that it wraps it up for today. It's, it is. Might be time to turn it in. Okay. Is that a phrase, turn it in? Pack it in. Might be time to pack it in. Okay. All right. Or as the Southern boys say. Time to piss on the fire and call in the dogs. <laughs> I like that one. Okay. You never heard of that? No, but I think that's how we should start winding up our shows with that. Okay. All right. Sounds good. I'll work on the, the language. Okay. All right. So until next time. Bye, folks. See you at the quiet end. Bye-bye. He said he called as soon as he heard about the murder. On the Monday before the murder. Okay, I found this on the web for call as soon as he heard about the murder. <laughs>